of you long to hear God speak to you? Do, you? do you long to hear God speak to you? How many, even if we don't long to hear God speak to us, know we need God to speak to us? Right? Every time we open up God's word, whether it be our devotional reading that we're doing through the year or a regular daily devotional or Fritz teaches or I lead from the pulpit or whatever, no matter what, we are hearing God speak. And we can either speak correctly or incorrectly. Well, you know my heart is to speak correctly. I want to make sure that I give God's people God's voice properly. We're back in the story of Joseph. Just at the right time as we get ready to study on Thursday nights, the rest of Joseph or the rest of Genesis in part 5, we are coming into the story of Joseph. So it should be fresh for those who are doing this on Thursday night. But just to bring us back to the story, um, the brothers have come before Joseph back in 43. Remember, they sit down and have a meal with them, and he begins to order them um, by their uh, birth order, and they don't know it. They're kind of astonished. and all that. That's where we left off. So as we begin today, we're going to go through 44, chapter 44, 34 verses, 34 verses. We're going to move quickly this morning. But as we begin this morning, I want us to get this thought into, I want to think about the idea of role reversal. Okay? You all know what I mean when I say role reversal. Right? People are going to exchange roles. They're going to be in different situations. I think of the movie back in the 80s called Trading Places. Does anybody ever remember the movie Trading Places? It's outdated, antiquated, I know. But it's the story of Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd's character. Dan Aykroyd is rich. He kind of looks down on the poor people. Eddie Murphy's like, you know, one of the poor people. And for whatever reason, you know, they get switched and get to assume each other's roles. And it gives them each other's perspective. And I think sometimes when God does role reversals for us, he does it to give us perspective. And I was going to share this at the end, but let me just share this as an illustration up front in my own life. Um, I remember how many times in ministry over the years where somebody has come to me and wanted prayer for things that I thought were kind of, eh, it's kind of goofy. I didn't say that outwardly. Inwardly, I, I was, you know, they would say, would you please pray for me? We just lost our pet. Or I'm having knee surgery. And of course, because I couldn't relate to it, I would say, yeah, I'll pray for you. But inwardly, I'm going, it's just a dog. It's just a dumb dog. Or, oh, come on. It's just a knee replacement. Really, do I have to pray for that? Well, you know, both times that I did that inwardly, God gave me an opportunity to experience what they were going through. The first time I lost a pet, I was a puddle on the floor. Roll reversal. Then I had ACL knee surgery. Guess what I don't do anymore when people ask for prayer for knee surgery, right? God's given me opportunities in my life and put me in other people's places. Why? So I can gain their perspective. And that's what's happening in this part of the story right now. They don't know it yet, but this is what is going to be happening for Joseph and his brothers. Now, I want you to think about the role reversal that takes place here. Before, back in the early part of the story, they were in a position of control. Remember over Joseph? They were over him. They're the ones that did and manipulated, did all these things to him. They were in a position of control, and Joseph wasn't. Now, what we're seeing is Joseph, through God's sovereignty, is now in a position of control so they are in a role reversal. Does everybody understand where I'm going with that? Okay. So what do we see in the role reversal? I want to show you two points in terms of the role reversal. Verses 1 through 17, we're going to see Joseph's plan and purpose. Okay. And if you look, so we're going to focus on Joseph's plan and purpose, or God's plan and purpose, using Joseph to test the brothers. Okay. We're still at the place where God is working on their hearts. God is looking to test them. God is going to use Joseph through his plan and his purpose. Now, if you, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to give this as a cross-reference. I'm not going to go back there. But if you go back to Genesis 37, 18 through 28, in contrast to Joseph's plan 
to reveal something about the brothers, we see their plan in terms of what they did to Joseph earlier. Okay, we go back and we see their plan, and now we're going to see Joseph's plan as he works it out. And so what, what, I, what I used for my notes for this section in verses 1 through 17, I called it the ruse of the test. The ruse of the test. And you say, how many, how many of you use the word ruse on a regular basis? Right? It's not a word we use a lot, right? But the word ruse means strategy. It means a strategy. And so what was, was happening here is God is using Joseph in a ruse. He's using them unknowingly. He shows up and he's working on a strategy to get to the brothers. I the scenes. So let's look at the ruse, okay? So after he's had him for supper and everything's good, he's, he's honored them. Yes, and, and, and let, allowing him to eat with him. It says in verse 44, verse 1, Then he commanded his house steward, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of the sack. So he's blessing them. And he's continuing to bless them. So he's continuing to bless them. That means I have to stay behind the pulpit. So he's going to continue to bless them. By putting money in their sack. But there's a reason. There's a ruse. There's a strategy. He's, he's doing this on purpose. So he says, put the money back in the mouth of their sack. Remember what happened last time? He did that. Then in verse 2, he says, put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and the money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. Now watch this. This is purposeful. Stick the money. Don't just randomly stick it in anybody's sack. Stick it in the youngest brother's sack on purpose. So God is working pur purposely and God is using Joseph to test the brothers. Watch this. In verse 3, as soon as it was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys, which assumed that this is all happening later in the evening. In the morning, as soon as it was light, he's going to send them away. They're going to go away thinking they're going home. They had just gone out of the city and were not far off when Joseph said to the house steward, up, follow the men. Here's the ruse. Here's the strategy. He's sending the steward after the, the men. Why? Because he's just planted a cup in, in Benjamin's sack. He's going to use this to get to the boys. Right? So it's very purposeful. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Has Joseph done good and blessed them? He has. So he's planting this so he can get after the boys' hearts. And he says to the steward, look, when you catch them, here's what I want you to say. Why have you repaid evil for good? Why have you gone and done this thing when I have done good for you. Is it not the one with which my Lord drinks and which indeed he uses for divination? You have done wrong in doing this. So he's, he's, he's setting them up. He's setting the boys up. And you could say, well, that's not very nice. But in all reality, I believe God is the one that's setting them up. And he's simply using Joseph to get to them. And what he's saying, he says, tell them, hey, look, don't you know that this is the cup? This is, you've not just taken from anybody, but you've taken a cup from the second in command of Egypt. The one that your Lord, the one that blessed you, drinks from, and he uses for divination. You say, well, what's divination? Divination is the idea of seeking after things or Gaining knowledge about things without going to the God of the universe. God clearly forbids divination. By the way, do you know a form of divination today? It's called astrology. 
people who read their, you know, their charts and their horoscopes and all that kind of stuff. And if you're driving down the road and you see a medium, that's divination. That's seeking after things that you should be going after only to find the answers from God. So why would Joseph do this? Would Joseph know that divination is wrong? The, New, the, the Old Testament has been written yet. All the laws haven't been written yet, but does he know that divination? I think he knows that divination is wrong. But why does he have to, why does the steward have to say, this is the cup that my Lord, your Lord uses for divination? He can't give away who he is yet. He has to play the character. He's still second in command. He, he's still an Egyptian to these boys. They don't know that he's the brother because God isn't ready to reveal this stuff yet. But you can already know in the story, this, if Joseph wants to play this out and intend it for evil, these boys are in trouble. You, you do understand that, right? These guys are in trouble if Joseph plans to play this out the way he could. Continue on. So the steward puts the plan into action. So he overtook them. That's the steward. He spoke these words to them. They said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Now, were they telling the truth? Were these honest men? At this point, these guys were completely honest. They hadn't done anything wrong. So they're kind of confused. Why would the steward come and do that? Verse 8, behold the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks, we brought back to you for the land of Canaan. Okay, we, we brought back, we paid for everything. It was never our intention to take anything from anybody. So at this point, these guys are more honest than they've been in the past. How then could we steal silver or gold from the Lord's house? Look, we don't need it. We, we brought money back. We don't need it. Now watch what they say, and this is very dangerous. Because they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Verse 9. With whomever of your servants is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. Now we know from the text who it is, right? Whose cup? Who's got the cup? These guys unknowingly are potentially offering up the death of their brother Benjamin. And for them to continue to be slaves. Think about where they're at right now, how their hearts have changed. Does verse 9 prove that they're honest men? Yeah, because they think what? We didn't do it. We're not the ones that put it in there. We know we didn't. So, with whomever your servants is found, let him die. So they're thinking there's no way they're going to find anything because there's no cup in any of the sacks. They're risking a lot right here. And what they don't know is they're potentially risking the life of their brother Benjamin and their own lives as slaves. Verse 10. So he said, the steward said, now let, let it be according to your words. With whom it is found shall be my slave and the rest of you shall be innocent. Now watch this. Verse 10. There's mercy in this, isn't there? Because what was the proposition in verse 9? If it's found, you go ahead and kill that one and the rest of us will be slaves. And he's turning around and saying what? No. There's mercy. Whoever is, it will be my slave and the rest of you are free to go, basically. Verse 11. Then they hurried. Each man lowered his sack to the ground. And each man opened his sack. They hurried. I don't know why. <laughs> the only thing that allows for that to be true in context, they hurried, is they hurried believing that there was nothing in the sacks. And how would they know there was anything in the sacks? The only two people that knew there was, was anything in the sack would have been Joseph and the steward. So they're acting in absolute innocence right here that they're all going to be good. Verse 12, he searched the steward, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Okay, at this point, with the cup being found in Benjamin's sack, even with mercy being extended to the brothers, what's the consequence? Benjamin's a slave, right? Benjamin's now a slave. Now, why is that a problem? 
Why is that a problem? Because you're going to find out in a minute that there was surety made for Benjamin's life earlier. And you're going to see the major character come into play in a minute is going to be Judah because of this. Right? So, uh uh-oh, we got a problem. Verse 13, now this is interesting. At this point in the story, where is Benjamin in relation to his father, Jacob? How does Jacob feel about Benjamin in relation to the other brothers? No different, right? So he, and I can prove it as we go further in the text in a minute, he still favors Benjamin. So at this point, probably knowing that he still favors Benjamin, this is their chance to do what? Get him out of the way. Just like they did earlier with Joseph, this is our chance. Look, the rest of us are innocent. We were told we can go free. This would be, Benjamin would be a slave and we're good to go. Except we're going to see what's, what's going to happen. Verse 13. Then they tore their clothes and when each man loaded his donkey, they returned to the city. Now why did they tear their clothes? Tearing clothes back in those days would have been a sign of grief and mourning. Why were they mourning that Benjamin was the one found with the cup? Wouldn't they be elated? Or maybe has God begun to change their hearts and they're mourning over the fact that Benjamin is now, by oath, he's now going to become a slave. And it could be that they're reflecting back in terms of their proposition that they, if if the steward had listened to him, to them, that would have cost Benjamin his life. So they're grieving at this point. They're tearing their clothes and they're going to go back to the city. Now, look at what happens in verse 14. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, so they now go back to Joseph's house He was still there, and they fell to the ground before him. Now, fell to the ground is the idea of bowing down. Is this the first time the brothers bow down to him? No. And again, they're bowing down right now, still unknowingly. They do not know this is Joseph. They do not know that the dream has been fulfilled. They're bowing down to him now. Why? The other thing before it was reverence. Here, it doesn't say it in the text, but they're bowing down based on the context. I think they're bowing down in fear. Because they know that at this point, they're innocent, but they know that they're no longer in control, that there is somebody over him, over them, second in command, who controls the outcome of their lives. And so they bow down and they fall to the ground before him. Joseph says to them, what is this deed that you've done? Do you not know that such a man as I indeed can practice divination? Now, this is really interesting. Divination, from what I researched for the Egyptians, would have been, they would have taken this cup They would have placed oil or water in the cup. Or they would have put water in the cup. They would have dropped either oil or a stone in the cup. And based on the way the water would disperse, they would literally read signs into it from their gods. They would read signs into it. See, isn't it good that we don't have to do that? We don't have to open a cup and drop it and read, start reading the signs. Do you know Christians who read into signs? That's scary. That's dangerous. We don't need, we, we've got God's word. We've got God's Holy Spirit. We've got, you know, prayer. We can seek God in, in terms of that. But, but here's the reality. He, what he's saying to them is, do you realize that you stole my cup, second in command, and I can practice divination with it? Didn't you understand that when you took the cup, If I can truly practice divination, don't you know I would have found you out? So he's still playing the character. How did, you know, these guys aren't even asking the question yet. How did they know the cup was there? Maybe it was through the 
divination. So he's still playing the role of the second in command. He's had not revealed yet that he's their brother. Verse 16, so Judah said, what can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? So they're speechless. What do we do now? What do we say to you? And how can we justify ourselves? They're wanting to justify themselves for something they haven't done. We ever do that? You ever try to justify yourself? You know, I heard somebody say recently, this is really interesting. I, I, I had somebody, a, a Christian friend post this on Facebook, and I really, it made me scratch my head. You know, when you're in conflict with somebody, you're in a relationship with somebody, and you're in conflict, the, 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 the point that was made was say sorry even if you didn't do anything. Say sorry even if you didn't do anything. Is that really what God wants us to do? Does God want us to say we were sorry even when it wasn't our fault? I'm not sure that's from God. That's what they're doing. They're saying, what can we do to justify? We know we didn't do anything, but we'll say whatever we say to justify us. We didn't do anything. Look at what they say next. God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slave. Both we and the one in possession of the cup has been found. Now watch this. This is interesting. They say, we're now slaves of you. Well, that wasn't part of the bargain. Remember, the steward said, no, 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 I'm changing the deal. Your deal is whoever has the cup will die and the rest of us will be slaves. The steward changed it on him and said, no, only the one who has the cup, the rest of you are free. What do these guys say now? We're your slaves. And I love what they say in 16. God has found out the iniquity of your servants. What iniquity is he talking about here? Do you think it's the iniquity here? No, because it can't be because they're innocent. They have to. God's still working on their heart for the iniquity that they committed against Joseph. God's using the circumstances, the ruse, as it were, the strategy that Joseph is using right now to get to their hearts. And he's going past the so-called sin here, the so-called iniquity that they committed. He's going for the real iniquity, the iniquity they committed against their brother Joseph years ago. God is after their hearts. Verse 17, but he said, far be it for me to do this. The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave, but as for you, go, to, go in peace to your father. I'm not going to make you slaves. He could have. And wouldn't it be ironic if they would become his slaves after what they had done to him? Right? Now, now, in verses 18 through 34, we see Judah's plea and proposal. He's going to plea. He's going to make a plea. And if you go to Genesis 42, 21, and write that down, you see that later in the story, it's revealed by the brothers that when they were doing all this to Joseph, he was pleading for his life. Talk about role reversal. Now who's doing the pleading? He's pleading for his life, right? Now the tables have been turned. Now it's your turn to plead. God's doing this on purpose. And here's the result of the test. We saw the ruse of the test, the strategy. Now we're going to see the result of the test. 18. Then Judah approached him. Interesting that Judah comes to him. Not, not Reuben, but Judah. Judah approached him and said, Oh, my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears, and do not be angry with your servant, for you are equal to Pharaoh. So he respects him. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have, your, have you a father or brother? So he's, he's getting this information back out of them. He wants to find out about, right, his family. Verse 20, We said to my Lord, We have an older father and a little child of his old age, now his brother is dead. That would be Joseph. So he's just recounting all the things that he had heard before. So he alone is left of his mother and his father loves him. Okay? Just reminding him. Verse 21. Then you said to your servants, bring him down that I may set my eyes on him. He's just recounting the story. Verse 22. But we said to my Lord, the lad can't leave his father, for if he'd leave his father, the father would die. This is Benjamin. He's recounting what happened to get Benjamin back with them. You said to your servants, verse 23, however, unless your youngest brother comes down with us, you will not see my face again. So he's just reminding Joseph 
of what Joseph had said to them earlier. Verse 24, thus it came about when we went up to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. Verse 25, our father said, go back, buy us a little food. So he's just recounting all the events. Verse 26, but we said we can't go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down for we can't see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. What he's saying is we can't go back unless Benjamin goes with us. Right? Because remember, that's what Joseph's re re request was earlier. Don't even bother coming back in my presence unless you bring your younger brother. Verse 27, your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, surely he is torn in pieces, and I have not seen him since. That's Joseph. They still think Joseph is dead. Right? Or far away. Verse 29, if you take this one also from me and harm befalls him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. What he's saying is Jacob says to him, I've already lost Joseph. If I lose Benjamin too, I, I, I might as well die. I can't lose him. Verse 30, now therefore when I come up to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us since his life is bound up in the lad's life. So he's, he's saying, look, this is Judah's defense. He's saying, my life is bound up in Benjamin's life. When he sees that the lad is not with us. Now, why would the lad not be with them? Because he's now become a slave of the second in command. They're free to go. But they'd have to go without Benjamin, and Benjamin would be left behind. And what Judah, this is where I think Judah's getting to God's heart. Judah says, if he's not, if he's not going to go with us, Jacob's going to die. Thus your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant or a father down to Sheol in sorrow. He's saying, if I don't go back with Benjamin, I can't face dad. I can't. Because, now what does this say? Think about back in the story in Genesis 37. Whose idea was it to sell Joseph into slavery? It was Judah's. Judah was the one that says, don't kill him, let's sell him. Now, now, his heart is changing. He says, look, I can't go back without Benjamin. Now, does he care about Benjamin? Probably. Does he care about his father here? Absolutely. I can't go back without Benjamin. Look what he reminds him in verse 32 of what, what covenant he has made with his father. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. He's saying to Joseph, unwillingly, he doesn't know this is Joseph, he just thinks it's the second in command, he knows his authority over him, but he says, look, if I don't go back, I promise my father I would be the deposit for my brother. I promise that I would take his place. So don't let me blare, bear that blame forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad and let the lad go up with his brothers. He's saying is, swap us out. Swap us out. I'll take Benjamin's place. I will stay be here and be your slave. Just let my brother go. Verse 34. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? For I fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father. Judah goes from being selfish 